everyone for joining again and liking and sharing subscribing to our channel welcome to our episode number 3 of ideal voices i'm very excited to have devin prasad from plg joining us from toronto office today he practices canadian competition antitrust laws and also advises clients on foreign investment marketing corporate compliances law matters he started as an articling student with plg and is now a senior associate at the firm He is passionate about promoting diversity in the legal industry and was awarded as a change agent in law by 2019 Lexport Zenith Award. He is currently the vice president of South Asian Bar Association in North America and also was named 2020 Young Lawyer of the Year by Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers Ontario. Welcome Devin. Welcome to IT Voices. Can you tell us more about your journey as a legal professional and how did you started with BLG? Yeah, so I, I work at a law firm called uh, Borden Landner Gervais, and I basically started working there right out of law school uh, in Canada or in Toronto. Uh, they do a hiring process called uh, on-campus recruitment or OCIs, and uh, basically you do interviews there, then you get hired for a summer term if you're. They like you. They'll bring you back again for articling, and articling is a ten-month kind of apprenticeship program that we have here in Canada. And uh, from there, uh, at most of the large firms on Bay Street, uh, they put you through a rotational program, where you do, uh, you know, three, three, four-month uh, rotations with d- the different groups in a full-service firm. I actually started out uh, in the litigation group because I thought I wanted to be a litigator. Because I watched a lot of Law and Order growing up, I watched a lot of JAG, um, uh, and I thought, okay, uh, I, I like being on my feet in front of a courtroom. And then the first time I was in front of a, a courtroom in small claims court, I got really nervous, and I was like, maybe this isn't for me. Uh, so then I did a rotation in the corporate group, and I actually got to work on uh, the Loblaws uh, Shoppers merger that was going on at the time. It was the largest retail transaction in Canadian history, and. probably still is and uh i got to do a lot of work uh with that group and i loved especially the people i was working with i think for most uh articling students uh that's kind of what happens you gravitate towards the people more than the actual work and yeah. uh you know uh from there i just became an easy fit and i started as an associate and uh you know i've been there for for almost 6 years now so Devin, as an articling student, can you please walk us through your day at BLG, and can you also share what made you lean towards this particular practice area? Yeah, uh, so I do uh, competition antitrust and foreign investment law. Uh, so yeah. when I was in law school, I didn't even know what that was. It wasn't until I started at the firm and got to do. That's why it's so beneficial to do those rotations. Um, so you get to sample a little bit of of everything, and. uh remember i mentioned that i liked litigation uh the reason i was so drawn towards the group uh, in addition to the people was because it was a hybrid group that practiced both you know litigation work and corporate work and in that sense what you could do was uh do a little bit of m&a stuff do like some transactional work uh do marketing uh compliance work do advocacy work there's just a bunch of uh, different things that uh you know this type of practice allows you to do and so you're never doing the same thing twice and that was with the most appealing thing i'd say uh from when i was a student what drew me to blg was uh the fact that uh, i went i went to the university of ottawa law school and uh they put on this big barbecue there every year where you can meet practitioners and then they'll help you uh in terms of uh you know interview prep and that sort of thing so seeing that outreach at a early age in my legal career was definitely something that drew me towards the firm and and I think they also sponsored quite a few scholarships and course prizes while I okay. was there. It's really uh great to see a firm that was so engaged and then I read a lot about them about all of the great diversity initiatives that they do and uh it made me think that that would be a, a great place to work and I I haven't regretted that decision. Since you spoke about diversity I'm aware that you are a vice president of South Asian Bar Association. Uh our viewers would like to know how did you get involved with this organization 
and how are you helping the ITLs coming from South Asia? I think uh, it's definitely harder as an internationally trained lawyer to kind of make inroads to your legal career here at, a, at, a, at an early stage, but it, that's not saying it's, it's impossible. And I think things are changing thanks to organizations like SABA um, and, you know, FACL and Cable and other organizations like that, Yeah. R Rhoda. Um, what I'd say is that uh, for SABA, uh, when you're in law school in, in Ontario or in most places in North America, they have uh, something called SALSA, which is the uh, South Asian Law Students Association. Right. And uh, SALSAs are, are pretty big across the country. And we used to have a unified group that I was the president of for all of the Ontario schools, the Ontario SALSA chapter. So I had that when I was a law student, that kind of one-on-one -on -one connection with SABA members. And then I got to uh, attend their gala because I was given a student of the year award. <laughs> student of the year, when I heard that at first, I thought it was like the movie with uh, Ali Abad. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, there was no dancing or, uh, or singing. And so I was disappointed by that, but the gala was amazing. I got to meet so many encouraging uh, professionals. Um, and, and as a young entrant into the legal world, that was kind of, you know, the best part of uh, you know, meeting so many new people is expanding your network um, and having like all these new great mentors who were part of the SABA board. And then uh, obviously I made those connections there. And then a couple of years into being a lawyer, I was asked to uh, submit my name for the SABA board by uh, a great pillar of our community, Rusty, uh, uh, Rusty Juma, um, who is a, a GC now at a big tech company. So I'm very lucky to have mentors like that who have, you know, helped me out throughout the years and seen me through. And, and I'm really happy that Saba, especially in the last few years, uh, is really growing its advocacy, is growing its pro bono initiatives. It's trying a lot to help out uh, uh, in many different ways. And you mentioned that, uh, you know, ITL lawyers are now more and more uh, becoming part of the fabric of the Canadian legal community and legal market. Uh, it's so uh, great to see that. And it's great to see acceptance slowly starting to come around. Um, and SABA's membership has been increasing uh, exponentially uh, with uh, students who are NCA qualified or uh, part of the ITL program. And uh, what we've tried to do is we put out, uh, we have an ITL committee or section that, that uh, does programming and a lot of different uh, types of work for the ITL community. Uh, we've got uh, a pamphlet that kind of teaches these uh, students, you know, what they need to do, or we have resume building workshops. We have interview tech uh, workshops. So all these things uh, have been uh, a great. Uh, sort of characteristics. Uh, what sort of characteristics do you think a typical Bay Street law firms look out for a hiring uh, summer student or articling student? An insight to that would be great from your perspective. Yeah, I think uh, that kind of thing they're looking for has is, is changed in the last few years, especially with the uh, emergence of new discourses on, you know, uh, unconscious bias and uh, having kind of candidates who fit a mold. Before, everyone used to say, you know, law firms especially, that you know, to, to work here, you have to be a good fit, but like nobody really knew what fit meant. And what was invariably happening, I think, was that, uh, you know, partners were uh, invariably drawn to candidates who were similar to them. And that's, that's, that's normal. And that's not to say that those people are harboring any bias or anything like that. It's just, uh, if I was having a conversation with someone or during an, an interview and someone had all the same, uh, qualifications and a similar schooling and upbringing that I had, then I, I would naturally just like that person, right? Uh, and I think a few articles that came out uh, a couple years ago, one was Black on Bay Street by Hadia Rodrigue, really opened the eyes of, of changes that needed to be made in the recruitment process. And I think that's happened. Uh, what you see now is, well, first of all, ITL students are getting OCI interviews, which has never happened before. Uh, they have that one day where they 
uh, we'll do OCIs. And, and I've seen all of the Bay Street firms have, or most of them have hired uh, internationally trained lawyers through that OCI program. So, and you're starting out on the same level as any Canadian uh, uh, school uh, student. Yeah. Um, what the characteristics that I think that are universally looked for in, by any law firm are, is good experience, legal experience, and also good business experience. Because at the end of the day, this is a, a you know a corporate setting. So somebody who's got a great record of, of you know human rights and stuff like that. I think that they will probably ask you, you know, why are you drawn towards, uh, um, you know, working in a, in a corporate environment and just making sure that, you know, that person is, is going to like the work that they're going to be doing. Um, so, you know, having good legal experience, all of the internationally trained lawyers that we've hired at, at our firm have practiced law for several years in whatever jurisdiction they're coming from. And they've been quite successfully doing so because you know somebody who's practiced law for that long is going to have good writing skills, uh, good advocacy skills, um, kind of know their way around an office uh, rather than someone who's just kind of, you know, has only been a student and is now for the first time entering the workforce. Yes. So I think all of the things that, uh, you know, made you successful in whatever jurisdiction you're coming from are the things that, are, that uh, will make you a successful lawyer in Canada. And those are kind of the, the things that uh, the corporate law firms are looking for here as well. I will say that uh, making sure that your resume and cover letter uh, meet the kind of the standards or, or what the benchmark is for the Canadian market is important. So I would always advise, you know, anyone to, to reach out to one of the student directors at, at one of these firms or reach out to uh, organizations like Saba or FACL and ask them, hey, do you have anyone who could, you know, workshop my resume with me, just to make sure that all of the standards are similar to the Canadian resume. What has been the most rewarding experience in your legal career so far? And what keeps you motivated every day? Yeah, um, I think it's very important for any practicing lawyer that they actually do celebrate those kind of mini wins when they get them. Because otherwise, it might start to feel dreary that you're going through this process day in and day out. And, uh, you know, not, not seeing any end date in sight. The end date, uh, remember when I talked about how articling, I could remember everything that happened because I knew there was an end point and I knew to cherish every moment. So making those like little mini end points, uh, whether it's when you close a file, when you get a transaction through, whether you close a deal, like all of those mini end points, uh, you should definitely celebrate each one of those. Um, you, so yeah, each time I, I assist a client and they get their desired goal and they said that we did a good job, that's probably the most rewarding feeling for me. Um, outside of the actual legal work, you know, the work I do with Saba, the pro bono stuff, um, especially the stuff where I can meet new people and assist people. And when they tell me, hey, like, uh, thank you so much for your mentorship. I, f I just found a job. Um, you know, and now I feel like I can start my legal career. That to me is the most you know, rewarding thing from the human side um, and probably brings me the most joy. How important do you think uh, networking is for students in the legal industry? Can you please share some tips? Uh, extremely important. Uh, I know uh, we've had panels before uh, about like, you know, interview techniques and OCI prep and stuff like that, where we've had student directors uh, speak on those panels. And invariably, uh, after each panel, like the next year when I reach out for, to do the panel again, uh, those people have said, oh, you know, I met so-and-so at that uh, discussion and they kept in touch and they asked to go to coffee and, you know, their name stuck in my head and there was a position that was opening and I ended up recommending them for that. So those little mini connections are so important, especially in this industry, because a lot of it, uh, you know, not every job is posted. Uh, a lot of the time, someone who is thinking about a job opportunity will say, oh, I know this person. And if you're someone who's constantly reaching out and, and you know, not, not saying, hey, can you give me a job? Can you give me a job? But actually genuinely interested in that person's life that you're communicating with and you know, that person's practice, then I think those are the people who uh, come to top of mind when a 
when a new opportunity arises. So okay. networking is very important. Um, it's been a bit harder, obviously, because of the pandemic. You know, you can't just uh, ask someone to go to coffee anymore. But in some ways, I think it's actually a bit easier, too, because you can have these one-on-one -on -one, uh, virtual chats and you don't have to travel or meet downtown or go to some fancy uh, bar. Yeah. Um, so that uh, makes it easier. I would just say, uh, if you're someone who's asking for someone's time, know that their time is, is very valuable. Uh, literally, uh, so, you know, we, we have lawyers that are billing $1,000 plus an hour. So uh, make sure you have like a plan uh, when you go to meet them, uh, uh, things you want to ask them, specific uh, kinds of asks regarding their practice, regarding how they got maybe their career plan and, or career pathway, and, uh, you know, be engaged uh, at that point. Did you face any challenges or roadblocks to find article in positions or in your legal career or in your personal life? Uh, roadblocks, yeah. I think we've all had uh, roadblocks throughout life. Um, when I was, uh, before my legal career started, I met with a, a horrific accident where I was uh, almost uh, so disabled sorry. and you know bedridden for, for six to, to eight months. So it made you kind of like really take stock of life. I think in any of those instances, the best thing to do is have, uh, you know, lean on your support network and have some sort of introspection about, uh, you know, what's important. I think a similar thing happened again when uh, during uh, summer OCIs uh, in second year when I was in law school, I ended up having, you know, a ton of OCIs and a ton of infirm interviews. And at the end of the day, I guess I didn't, you know, play that uh, recruitment game the right way. I ended up uh, not getting a position, so that was a, a big blow to to kind of uh, my career trajectory. But the important thing is, I never gave up. What what happened was I just was more determined to work harder than ever, and uh, you know, through perseverance and hard work, you you managed to get through a lot. And uh, I'll always just say too that everything happens for a reason. That's my own personal belief and faith. Uh, so. Uh, every time you, you fail or you hit a roadblock, it's actually just a, a new learning opportunity. All about not giving up and being uh, resilient and at the same time, just work hard. So exactly. yeah. knowing your time will count is, is, is important. Yeah. yeah. And I guess uh, all these little, uh, little experiences make the person that who you are today. And at the same time, everything happens for a reason, like you said, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, I agree with that. One hundred percent. I am aware that you practice antitrust laws. Can you give us more insight on your practice area? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's such a wide uh, area of law, and I think most people who are in law school probably don't even know that it exists. Uh, so um, it gets a lot of uh, press these days because of the, you know articles that come out in the US and in the UK about, you know, we have to break up big tech. Uh, there has to be some sort of antitrust uh, regulator that, you know, comes down hard on these uh, tech companies. But, uh, you know, the industry itself actually is quite old. It started uh, way back in the, in, in the 1900s. Um, and especially like in the 30s, that's when anti, antitrust in the US was, was at its height, I would say. These days, um, and I'll just briefly explain uh, the life of a competition lawyer. Uh, if you're on the transactional side and two companies want to merge and they're big enough, they will have to seek approval from a regulator, whether it be uh, DOJ or FTC in the US. Uh, in Canada, it's the Competition Bureau. And uh, if, if these two companies meet these certain financial thresholds, uh, they need to have that approval for the, for the deal to go through. I'm obviously st stating in very basic terms here. Um, so uh, as a competition lawyer, usually if you're in private practice, you're helping those companies navigate uh, that regulatory process. And uh, from a kind of advocacy standpoint, um, there's a ton of uh, compliance work that comes with meeting uh, the, the provisions under the Competition Act. That include, you know, marketing and misleading advertising, uh, 
um, because there are like uh, both civil and criminal provisions under the act, you have, you have to instruct your clients very carefully on what they can and can't do and what they should and should not be doing. And then there is uh, the cartel provisions uh, under the Competition Act, which deal with criminal conspiracy. Okay. Um, so that's when two competitors are looking to like fix prices um, or you know manage output, that sort of thing. Uh, that, that is uh, illegal under uh, most uh, competition law jurisdictions, and I'm sure it's the same in, in India and uh, you know a bunch of jurisdictions yeah. in Asia. Yeah, like creating and, a monopoly, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not. It's not creating a monopoly in that sense. It's actually like collusion, okay. where like two competitors okay. are, are price fixing. Um, creating a monopoly. That we have a different civil offense for that here in Canada. Something called abuse okay. of dominance where they, a certain entity might be taking advantage of, of a powerful position that they hold in the market. Um, but there's tons of other uh, stuff that, that I would do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, advising companies about those provisions and creating you know, codes of conduct and like compliance decks. Also uh, on the class action side, if a company is found to have uh, violated one of these uh, criminal provisions in the Competition Act, whether it be price fixing or you know, deceptive marketing under the criminal side. Uh, there is a uh, right uh, for anyone to, to launch a class action against those companies. So managing that class action risk um, is, is an important part of being a competition lawyer, I'd say as well. Nice, okay. I actually practiced a little bit in the competition uh, antitrust laws back in India as well, So, but it was like, only for like a couple of months. Then I moved into intellectual property, which was like drastically different and contrasting principles that I practiced creating monopoly and hell yeah. It, uh, competition law is definitely interesting uh, where our students and viewers can see a pathway eventually. Um, yeah, um, and uh, sorry, a whole, a, a, a big part I, I left out is uh, foreign investment as well. So that's basically when any company uh, that has a foreign uh, ownership or is controlled by uh, a foreign entity or someone who basically not Canadian controlled wants to acquire a Canadian company, then they have to get uh, certain approvals under the Investment Canada Act. And if they're large enough or if they uh, are in a particular industry that the government mandates might create a national security risk, then we have to uh, help them traverse those waters as well. So okay. it is quite a quite a broad practice area, um, a lot of regulatory work, but uh, a lot of rewarding uh, kind of uh, traits that, that come with it because you know basically you have to learn a different industries for each one of your clients if you're, if you're advocating that uh, a certain deal should go through or a certain foreign investment uh, should not trigger uh, a, a review under the Investment Canada Act. Okay. How are the articling students and first year associates reviewed on their performance? Uh, as an articling student, uh, there's no formal billable requirements at most of the large law firms. Uh, maybe some of the mid tier firms have, have those, but uh, pretty much when you're articling, uh, your sole job is, is supposed to be testing out the different areas of law, figuring out what you want, but also um, you know, learning about how to be a lawyer, learning the skills and traits you need. So uh, at least in my experience, I didn't have a, a billable target of hours that I had to meet. What I did have to make sure that I did um, and how most articling students are graded are on their writing skills, their research skills, uh, their ability to kind of you know, think on their feet. The best students I've had uh, do work for me are always the ones who uh, say what they're going to do and do it on time. Um, and also like their work product is excellence, but they also take the initiative to know where to figure out or to ask, you know, what is the next step that uh, is gonna be uh, presented in this legal analysis I'm working on and how can I assist you with that? Um, so if, if you do all of those things as an articling student, you know, make good impressions, basically, you know, do excellent work and, and do it when you say you're gonna do it, then uh, those are the ones that are mo the most successful. Say as an associate as well, what 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 they're graded on? Um, a bunch of things, a lot of similar stuff as a junior associate. Um, 
but now you just have that added billable target um, of hours that you need to be hitting. And, uh, you know, I, I, when you're a junior associate, you should really just be trying to like learn the law, uh, you know, really get into the nitty gritty of how things work. If you're a corporate lawyer, learning how closings work, um, learning about corporate governance. And uh, yeah, if you do that stuff and you make great connections with the lawyers you're working with, then eventually you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to have to worry about hitting your billable target. Because when, when you're more junior, um, everyone kind of passes stuff on to you. So you should be exceeding your target, I'm sure, in, in, in those first years. Um, how about uh, people talk about, a lot about business development, how important that is for a junior associate and uh, for a lawyer. I'm sure that it's not a target for articling student, but eventually how to develop that skill. Um, um, yeah, I guess it depends what setting you're in. If you're at a large firm, like one of the big Bay Street firms, most of the clients are institutional. So okay. generating business is not really your primary concern, even as a senior associate or, uh, you know, sometimes even a junior partner, because uh, your main goal is to maintain and cultivate the, the current relationships that the firm has with these uh, institutional clients. And that's basically done by, you know, doing great work. Uh, if you're at a smaller firm or a sole practice, uh, obviously you're going to have to be your own marketing manager. Um, you're going to be the one who has to go develop a business and, and you know, find clients. Um, I, for junior lawyers, uh, what I've heard, the people who are, you know, the best uh, at generating business, it's usually because they have a certain expertise in something or they learn a certain expertise before kind of anyone else does and they, they kind of stamp their name on that. So if, uh, like take the uh, pandemic, for example, there's so many new rules and legislation uh, that came out that had to be interpreted. If you were one of the first ones who knew uh, those rules back to front, um, you could be an expert in that subject matter. And that's usually when people are seeking a lawyer, right? They seek you out for your expertise, right. not for how great your golf game is or for uh, how great of a uh, conversation <laughs> you had uh, at a Leafs game. So being an expert is probably the, the best thing you can do as a junior lawyer. Thank you so much, Devin, for joining us today and answering all our questions so patiently. Do you have any additional tips for our viewers? Uh, no, I think uh, we covered uh, all of the topics uh, today. I, I would encourage anyone, I'm always available to, uh, to answer questions for those who want to reach out. Um, and I'd like to commend you guys about the awesome work that you're doing um, at the ITL Network. And, you know, the videos that uh, you've been putting out in this series have been really, really insightful and also really helpful. So congratulations to you guys. I hope this continues and it's a big success. Thank you. We have come to the end of episode three of ITL Voices. Thank you for joining us. And remember to subscribe and follow us on all our social media channels for updates. Bye for now. Thank you.